What's up guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House. And my guest today is Darius Dale, the founder and CEO of 42 Macro. Today we get into the uh, a handful of topics, including the bubble in macro finance narratives that's emerged in the last 18, 24 months and how this can lead investors astray and how Darius avoids this from happening to himself and the investors that consult with him. Fascinating discussion, I hope you enjoy this. Three things before we kick it off. I'm hosting a conference in January in Vancouver, British Columbia with over 100 keynote speakers, including a handful of world leaders like former Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, former President of Mexico, Felipe Calderon, uh, Robert Richtag, Kiyosaki, Danielle DiMartino booth, but literally over 100 amazing keynote speakers are coming to have a party with me for two days in Vancouver. I'd love you to join. There's a pinned comment right beneath this video where you can find out more details. Number two, the ad revenue from this channel is now donated to an organization super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness and the way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas, surround them with supportive housing, career training, and just generally great influences on their life. I love what they do. Check them out if you're interested. And number three, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. All right, here's Darius Dale, enjoy. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause, welcome. What's up guys, Jay Martin here, investor and CEO of Cambridge House and I'm joined today by Darius Dale, the founder and chief executive officer at 42 Macro. Darius, how you doing? Excellent, man. This has been what, six or not six or eight months into this. I think the first person is that chief executive officer, he's usually a founder and CEO. So that kind of hit it struck a chord. I appreciate that. Thank you. How you Good. Doing? Yeah. No, my pleasure. Thanks for making the time. I'm excited to jump into like a web of directions here with you. Um, and uh, why don't we start here? If someone's not familiar with who you are, what 42 Macro is, can you fill us in? How do you spend your day, Darius? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate the opportunity to connect with your uh, your viewers. So 42 Macro uh, is, a, is a quantitative oriented macro risk management shop. Uh, what we do is we help investors, we consult investors, both professional and retail investors on their portfolio construction through the lens of what we call our grid regime process. It's a regime segmentation process uh, that allows us to sort of help investors orient the risk that they're type, the types of risks that they're taking, the amount of risk that they're taking, where they're taking risk and, and, and kind of, again, how much to, 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 what they're, they're doing um, through the, what we call our grids. Um, Goldilocks, reflation, inflation, and deflation, those are all obviously common um, nomenclature from financial markets. Um, but we have a, a, you know, a special twist with respect to how we think about the world. Um, we think about the world in, in rate of change terms. So growth accelerating, inflation decelerating, that's Goldilocks. Reflate, or growth, reflation is growth and inflation accelerating simultaneously. Uh, inflation is where growth is decelerating and inflation is accelerating, that's stagflation, if you will. And then deflation is lastly when both are uh, decelerating simultaneously. And so our mm -hmm. kind of our bread and butter is, is helping investors understand what, which of those regimes we're in, which of those regimes we're headed into, and all the associated asset allocation pivots that you have to make to, uh, to correspond with that. So that's what you mean when you say, when you describe 42 Macro as regime segmentation, I was like, okay, I got to get you to expand on that, but that's exactly what you're talking about, your grid, uh, yeah. your grid concept. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, what we're, you know, what we're trying to do, so you notice you might have heard one thing I said, which is uh, we're a macro risk management shop, which is very different than a macro economic you know, kind of, you know, your traditional kind of macroeconomist uh, line of work or your macro strategist line of work. What we're really trying to do is actually relate everything back to portfolio construction, back to the amount of risk people are taking in their portfolio, where they're taking those risks. Um, and I do believe that, you know, macro risk management is its own separate field relative to, again, you know, kind of macro prognostication. Um, I would argue there's a bubble in macro storytelling, particularly around inflation right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of that out there. So I, I want to be very clear, you know, what we're doing is the kind of macro investors do on the buy side. This is what the hedge funds do. This is what the mutual funds do, the pension funds do. These are the kinds of discussions and, and data sets, indicators, analyses, and tools that they use to help themselves, you know, kind of stay out ahead of that. And so one of the things we did with 42 Macro is, you know, having built up that knowledge base at my former shop at Hedgeye, um, where I was ultimately, was most recently the, the head of macro at, at that firm. You know, I kind of thought, hey, there's a lot of this information that can be very valuable for a broader audience, RA type investors, retail investors, people nearing retirement, people in our age, you know, kind of, you know, coming up the curve and, you know, in, in, in the midlife and things like that. So 
you know, this data is very valuable. These tools are very valuable. This inside, this, these four, these, these frameworks are extremely valuable because they help investors, you know, kind of make and save money across cycles. Okay. So you touched on something that's like front and center for me. You said there's a bubble in storytelling, right? Oh, and yeah. man, I, sp I spent a lot of time talking about this and looking at this because, you know, specifically since, since March of 2020, when the world began to go sideways, right? Like the mm -hmm. first trigger point, right? We saw this massive, what I would call a bull market in macro finance content emerge, right? Oh and, yeah. You know, I've been a benefactor of that. My, my channel saw phenomenal growth over the next 18 months, as did hundreds of others, uh, mm -hmm. which in one sense it's great because it's a whole bunch of people suddenly turning their attention to the market, to macro finance, to economics, to try to understand you know, what's going on out there. And, and hopefully that results in people take control over their financial future and, you know, digging deep into to what how the world functions and why the world functions the way it does. Downside to that is like with an abundance of content that's not vetted by anybody, you can oh, get yeah. led down the wrong trail really easily, right? Really so easily. you're obviously seeing that too. So can you expand? Because I love the way you put it, a bubble in storytelling. So what sees you that strikes you as red flags and gets you nervous or whatever? Yeah, no. So I, I, it, I would say, you know, the, with respect to inflation, and I'm certainly uh, kind of isolating that factor, okay. you know, the only other time in my career where I can remember the kind of intensity around the discussion on inflation being this high um, is, is kind of throughout the, the, the kind of mid to the, the, the middle of 2011, you know, kind of leading up from the part uh, from the kind of late 2010 when the Fed announced and started to implement QE2 all the way through kind of the mid to the, kind of through the fall of 2011. You know, the inflation narrative back then, this runaway inflation narrative proved to be incredibly wrong, right? You know, and, and our model has called for that, that, that inflection point in the middle of 2011. We, we nailed that. Um, we got, you know, we got long of bonds. We got long of defensive sectors and style factors in. And really, it was just a function of understanding that the rate of change of growth and inflation are more impactful to asset markets than the level. The narrative is correlated to the level of, of things. Like inflation is really high. Therefore, the narrative is really high. And right now, we're at a 30-year high for most uh, inflation statistics, so naturally, the narrative around inflation should be somewhere around a 30-year high if you believe those two variables are co-integrated as I do. However, the reality is you can make some very, very bad asset allocation decisions when you're at the peak of the narrative or the peak of the sign curve mm. for things like growth, for things like inflation, and ultimately monetary and fiscal policy responses to those dynamics. Okay, I'm going to pull on that thread for sure because you're right. And uh, I was really trying to like disprove the runaway inflation narrative, maybe four or six months ago, it was coming everywhere, every headline. And so I actually hosted a feature on this channel where I sat down with Dr. Lacey Hunt, Jeff Snyder, David Rosenberg, Danielle really, Park, really Jeff, Jeff Booth, every, every deflationist I could uh, get in touch with, right? And I was like, help me poke holes in this because the majority is overwhelming right now, right? Okay. And, and so what are you seeing? Because, you know, you could then fast forward to today, look at you know, recent inflation numbers and say, well, it looks like that is actually materializing. But, you know, we're incredibly reactive as retail investors. You know, I'm a retail investor. My audience is very much retail investors and, and we can respond um, with outsized proportion to near term events, right? Missing the longer term mm -hmm. trends and narratives. So totally. talk to me about. Yeah, I was going to say part of the reason uh, retail investors tend to be reactive is because they're not necessarily, you know, sort of they, their elbows and their fingers aren't touching the data. They're not, they're not forecasting these dynamics. More, they're, they're, forecasting, they're not forecasting growth and inflation and policy responses. They're forecasting the extrapolation of the narrative. Wherever the narrative is today, retail investors tend to take it on a one-to-one -one slope to, to, uh, to, to this next logical conclusion, which may not be correct with respect to you know, kind of the actual underlying data and the market responses to those things. So, uh, so I just wanted to call that out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like almost a relationship with recency bias, right? Like directly pulling what we're hearing today, heard yesterday into tomorrow's forecast and, and totally. that inertia will continue. Totally. I mean, go back to a year ago. I mean, we were making the call that we were going to see one of the most historic reflation trades of all time. Um, this is going back to the early part of the early beginning of November, 2020. And we said there was going to be five things that are going to happen that almost never happened simultaneously in, in the U S and global economies. You have growth accelerating, Inflation accelerating, corporate profit growth accelerating, record monetary easing, record fiscal easing. Like that, I mean, there's been 10 quarters since 1960 in the US particular where those things were happening. And obviously all 10 of those quarters, including the two that we got um, in the first half of 2021, 
you know, catalyze some extreme, you know, market events to the upside for risk assets and reflation type exposures. And so, you know, you know, the narrative back then was COVID, 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 COVID. There's going to be another, there's going to be a third wave, you know, the back, you know, this is pre-vaccine, this is pre, you know, pre the vaccine news. There was going to be a third wave. And even once we got the vaccine news, there was still very much a contingency of investors who didn't buy that, that recovery scenario. They thought, okay, we're not going to get people vaccinated. The third wave is going to be bigger. It's going to take longer. Um, you know, you didn't even see the response in the bond market that much until we got into the latter part of December, early part of January. So then I was kind of making fun of those, that contingency of investors back then as COVID bears, um, you know, in terms of, you know, just being re- reluctant to understand that the rate of change was likely to catalyze a uh, pretty historic inflation trade. And I would argue, you know, you can sort of poke fun. And I think it might be a little premature, but I certainly do believe a year from now, um, we'll have had the opportunity to poke fun at inflation bears right now as well. Okay. So talk to me about that. What are people missing if they're buying into this right now? Yeah, absolutely. If I could take it to the charts, because you know me, I, 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 I keep a 150 page slide deck with me. So <laughs> uh, we do this, uh, what we call our macro scouting report. Um, right. You know, what we publish this every month. We're, we're trying to do is kind of drill down into all the key, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, kind of all the key fundamental debates out there through all the right. lens of our regime segmentation process. And so, as I mentioned, um, so as I mentioned, regime segmentation, just a quick pit stop real quick, give you guys a visual of how that actually looks. We don't have to spend any time on it, but going to the end, to the, to the inflation that they, you know, our models are suggesting, you know, we run uh, two models simultaneously and we take the median to sort of, you know, catalyze our projections. And ultimately our models are pointing to a, a tremendous amount of disinflation over the uh, next 12 months. Now we're kind of at the peak of the inflation side curve right here. So the news, the noise, the noisiness around inflation, the Fed's reaction to inflation, I would argue the fiscal policy reaction inflation is potentially even bigger as it relates to the fiscal drag we might see as a function of it next year. Um, that's a big deal. But going back to that, so that's the medium term view. This is the cyclical view on inflation. Obviously, the secular view tells you we're kind of in Wally world with respect to headline CPI, certainly in Wally world with respect to core PCE, the Fed's preferred inflation metric. We're at all time high in terms of the SAR on median CPI. Um, you know, that's a 7% seasonal adjusted annualized rate. You know, so there's a lot of inflation out there. But when you actually do the math, and this is, you know, I'm glad you said you had the Lacey Hunts and the Jeff Snyder's on and the Harley Bassman's of the world, because those are people who do understand these dynamics, who do do the work and are, and are able to be forward looking as opposed to reactive to the markets. And I would put myself in that category as well. We've done a tremendous amount of work, you know, just from my career on Wall Street and understanding how, you know, what drives inflation, what drives growth. And so I built this model um, in this most recent macro scouting report, called, you know, called our U- uh, U.S. Secular Inflation Drive. So everyone's talking about, you know, okay, 6% inflation, there's going to be a, you know, not runaway inflation. I don't think that's the consensus, but I do believe there's a consensus that inflation is going to be much higher than it had been in the previous decade. I think that, I think we can sort of agree that that is the general consensus out there. And when you actually do the math on the drivers of inflation, things like automation, consumer demand, demographics, Fed reaction function, you know, so on and so forth, and you actually run that through a model, uh, through, a, through a dynamic factor model, the reality is you're only talking about the stationary mean of inflation going from about 1.8% in the 2010 to 2019 decade to somewhere between 23 to 2.7% in the 2010 and in, in the 2020s. So that's a meaningful shift, right? If you're talking about you know, uh, how negative real interest rates could get on average relative to the prior decade, you know, sort of the amount of uh, kind of financial repression we're likely to experience as investors. But that's not a huge shift as it relates to, you know, kind of the narrative around inflation, which is sell bonds with impunity, 60, 40 portfolios destroyed, risk parity is going to blow up and catalyze the end of the world. You know, that kind of narrative based investing, in our opinion, is not supported by the math that we're doing in our, in our, in our analysis. Now, can I ask you a question about that? So yeah. the first, yeah, the first line item on your inflation drivers, this may, may be a juvenile question, Darius, I'm not sure, but I would have, I would have assumed something like automation would be a deflationary force, right? Because we're moving labor costs, we're increasing efficiency. Whenever technology eats any industry, prices come down. Tech is very deflationary by nature, right? So, just mm-hmm. could you expand on this a little bit for me? Just that specific line item. Yeah, absolutely. So, what we're showing here, and I can actually take you to the chart. Um, so, the chart here on slide uh, forty. What we're showing here, how we're uh, quantifying, because we we're trying to quantify everything, all these different sort of drivers of, of the narrative of, of the time series. And so what we're looking at is the consumption of fixed capital, so CapEx, divided by the compensation of employees, so, so on, a, on a nominal basis. And what we're seeing is automation, you know, particularly throughout the 2000s decade, 
really catalyze a step lower in inflation from you know this point here. You know this kind of you know prior to two thousand nine, prior to two thousand ten, inflation you know going back to nineteen seventy had averaged four point six percent. This big gap higher in automation, you know, kind of in the early two thousands, is the reason that inflation only averaged one point eight percent in the twenty ten to twenty nineteen decade. So in terms of how the the models um, you know kind of signaling that this might be a little bit inflationary is that we're actually getting less automation now relative to what we averaged in the 2010, 2010 to twenty nineteen decade. So consumption of fixed capital as a percentage of, of uh, as a ratio to, to the compensation of, 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 of humans, of employees, you know, that was a 27% ratio on average from 2010 to 2019 decade. We're now down to 26%. So on balance, on net, going back to this table, we're actually moving in a direction that's positive for inflation, not negative, right? And it's about the rate of change if you're talking about the change in this time series from a 1.8% stationary mean to something that's different. It's about the change. Okay. Okay. So I think I, I did understand that correctly. Thanks for clarifying and expanding on that. So <clears throat> before we we jumped into these charts, you mentioned some common mistakes investors make, you know, misreading inflation signals. And what are some of those most frequent that you see people making today? Yeah, absolutely. So so making today, I think there's a very big contingency of investors who are trapped on the short side of bonds. And we can take this to the data um, right now, you look at um, you know the CFTC uh, positioning data, which shows investors are still net short. This is hedge fund investors, not speculative net length in the futures and options markets. They're still short the ten year to a uh, to to a you know pretty aggressive degree. That's a minus two hundred forty two thousand ish uh, contracts in terms of um, you know uh, month over month. And again, this month over month, they've actually gone from a net a slight net long position to a, a very big net short position. And so obviously, month of what's happened in the last month, right? Well, we've gotten a couple of inflation prints that put a six handle on headline CPI that got the market a little spooked. We had a core PC print of 4% that got the market a little spooked. And more importantly, I would argue it's gotten Jay Powell a little spooked. So you're talking about sophisticated investors, hedge fund investors, which typically are less reactive to the narratives. But you know, the work, you know, if you, you separate the hedge funds, the below median performers are very much, you know, like retail investors, if not worse, because they think they're smarter than retail investors, but they actually typically aren't. Hmm. You know, so you're talking about the below median hedge fund person shorting bonds into an epic, you know, short squeeze in bonds over the past couple of weeks. So, you know, it's not just professional, it's not just retail investors who get caught up in the narratives. It's hedge fund investors who, you know, sort of masters of the universe who convince themselves in the rooms that they operate in that they are, in fact, smarter than, um, you know, the time series of inflation or smarter than the base effect dynamics or you know, fiscal policy drag, all this stuff that's eminently forecastable and modelable. You know, they tend to, even at the peak of the inflation sign curve, they make those types of mistakes as well. Okay. Now, can you talk to me about your portfolio, Darius, where are you putting cash right now? Where are you looking for opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So out of respect for our paying customers, so I, I won't go into detail in terms of the specific line items. But one thing we do as, as a function of our, our, you know, as a function of our group bridging process is orient the types of risk we're taking in the portfolio construction with respect to um, the, you know, the kind of, you know, with respect to, to those, those group regimes. Um, you know, as I'm talking, I'll pull up a chart, you know, so the, the actually, I, you know, so uh, no, I don't have it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So the, what I'm really trying to say is, is, so we believe based on a probability basis that the world or the U.S. economy, the world economy is going to be an X, Y, Z regime right now. It's inflation is the dominant regime right now. We believe that the probability of remaining in inflation over the next three months is about you know, 50% or thereabouts, or just, just shy of 50% thereabouts. So we're going to have 50% of our uh, portfolio representing things that look that, that should do well based on our back test in that regime. So right now you talk about what inflation looks like from a from a um, you know from a from a risk management standpoint. You want to be in low beta type equities, you know, mega cap growth type equities, quality, dividend, defensive type equities. You know, that's very different than you know the cyclicals, high beta momentum, and small caps that you were in that a lot of investors you know kind of got trapped in mm -hmm. heading into this kind of most recent smackdown um, in, in, in financial markets and fixed income. You can be long things like the long bond, tips, treasury belly, IG credit, you know, EM dollar debt. You know, it's a very different setup as opposed to being long. You know, the more riskier parts of credit, you know, kind of the higher yielding parts of credit and, and certainly the higher volatility uh, parts of credit, um, or, you know, down the credit spectrum out on the risk curve. So, you know, in terms of what we're doing, so we're saying, hey, there's a 40% chance of being in inflation over the next three months. Let's make sure 40% of our portfolio is oriented with those sector and style factor overweights in the fixed income and equity markets and in the commodity markets as well. We do that same process with commodities and currencies as well. 
And if there's a, you know, let's say the, the balance of the, 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 the 40% or the balance of the 100% is in, you know, spread across the other regimes, we'll make sure we have exposure to that as well. And so what we're trying to do is help investors at every interval construct a portfolio that is one making the highest probability bets that are likely to be acknowledged and realized by financial markets. You know, so this is, this is how, and going back to this, the question you asked earlier, a lot of big, estate, big mistake investors make, retail investors in particular, is you know, they get caught, around, caught up in the narrative. And it's not that the narrative is wrong, right? I just showed you a table you know, with a ton of data that said, hey, look, inflation is going to be 50 to 90 basis points higher on average over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. That tends that directionally that agrees with sort of the consensus view on inflation. So here's what a retail investor would do with that information. Or here's what a bad hedge fund investor would do with that information. They're going to be back up the truck, be long energy. They're going to be long uranium. They're going to be long you know, value stocks. And they're going to be long that stuff with impunity at every interval. Right. Even if we go through a six to nine month period where growth and inflation are slowing and make and catalyzing financial markets to sell those types of exposures. And so what will typically happen is that their geometric returns you know, will typically be very poor relative to the average annualized returns they might experience over a longer term time frame. Right. And this is how you wind up with a worse investment outcome over time because mm-hmm. you're not compounding returns. You're suffering drawdowns. And the whole point of macro risk management is to help investors avoid drawdowns by making sure the bets that you're taking in your portfolios agree with the forward, market, with the forward economic outlook. OK, now. Now, what what indicators are you going to look for three to four months down the road mm-hmm. to to, you know, it's, I guess, to ensure you're not falling victim to your own confirmation bias, but, you know, to, to let you know things are playing out the way you expected them to or differently, but giving you some insight. Yeah, great question. So great question. So it's, it's you know, I, I don't, I, I tend to, people, you know, I, I guess I've earned a reputation for being a, you know, reasonably intelligent guy on Wall Street, but I don't think much. You know, I, I you know, I, my thinking comes in, in building these models, building these tools and just allowing the tools to work, right? Like, you don't, when you turn on your car, you're not thinking about how the engine works, right? You're just making sure that you're driving the car safely to your next destination. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of how our process works in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's robust, it's well-programmed, it's automated, it's, 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 you know, it's very dynamic in the sense that it's constantly pulling in data through the lens of our Nowcast models. We run the same uh, kind of Nowcast framework for growth, or sorry, so the United States, we run it for growth. And then we run it for inflation as well. So if you kind of zoom into some of these features, you know, it's everything that's ticking in commodities, inside the CPI, inside the PPI and other data sets. You, know, you look at it on a on growth basis. It's, you know, labor market, you know, the you know, retail sales or consumer, you know, consumer spending, all these, you know, various components that we back tested and understand that, hey, these these data sets in particular have a tremendous amount of value for predicting the kind of the slope of this line, you know, the slope of growth, you know, right here we're showing on this red line here is the OECD composite leading index time series. That's a monthly read of, you know, kind of correlates to real GDP. But the, you know, the beauty of that process, the beauty of that data set is that A, it's standardized across economies. And secondarily, it gives you a monthly read on the process. So ultimately what we're trying to do is use those nowcasts, use the forecasts associated with each line item in the nowcast that ultimately feed into the forecast and, you know, in our growth and inflation, you know, dynamics on a, on a medium term basis to kind of understand, okay, where are we going to be on this chart? What's the regime? And as you can see, we kind of were exiting a big period of elongated period of being in reflation, right? Like we were in reflation for a really long period of time. Mm. Well, if you notice the world kind of got harder, it's got everyone listening, understands that the world got, a, it, the asset markets have gotten difficult, more difficult to risk manage since kind of the mid to beginning to mid of the summer. And the reason of that is you can just see from a color coding perspective that the world, the economy has changed. And it's not just the U.S. You know, you look at this, we run this, those same models, those same quantitative frameworks to project growth and inflation dynamics in every major economy in the world. So this is, you know, the, these are 35 of the world's largest economies. And as you can see, this is easy. You know, this green is easy here. This is hard. Yeah. This is, you know what I mean? Like it just, the color coding, you can just see, like, there's a reason I use color coding. Sure. This is reflation. This is deflation and inflation. So you look at it and say, hey, man, we've been... You know, it was just so easy to make money. You can buy a nickel and it turned into a dime. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that, that's, that, was, that was kind of the world we exited. And we're now in this world where, you know, the asset markets are having a harder time, you know, assigning premium multiples to, to the kinds of sectors and style factors that should not be going up, you know, when you're when the growth is slowing, when you're in a growth slowing environment. So, you know, clearly that's being on the right side of this, this distribution. Of course it is. Okay. 
Okay, fascinating. Now, now talk to me about your your exposure right now to uh, like what we consider the safe haven off grid asset classes like gold, silver, Bitcoin. Darius, how, how do you structure those into your personal portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. So we do have exposure to crypto. Uh, we're long uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, in a portfolio construction. We're actually also long uh, the BLOK ETF as well, the 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 the, the, the blockchain ETF. Yeah. So you know we we do believe that, or at least we do believe our back tests show that you can be long crypto in inflation. It's, and in fact, it, it it tends to outperform you know something like equities or credit um, in inflation relative to or sort of you know more riskier equities and credit inflation. So. As I mentioned, we've back tested everything that ticks through the lens of expected returns, percent positive ratios, volatility, and covariance to understand. Hey, when our model is saying we're going to regime A, what is you know find, go find the regime A back test and see if it you know fits. If it doesn't fit and we're long it, we need to sell it. And if it fits and we're not long it, we probably need to buy it. Um, so that's kind of how the process works from a soup to nuts perspective. But so when you talk about, you know, going to the headline back test, the overall back test, the first row on this table, you see as an investor, you get paid being long Ethereum and Goldilocks reflation or inflation generally. You know, you have a, a decent, you know, decently high percent positive ratio. It's deflation that tends to get you blown up in cryptocurrency um, from a percent positive ratio perspective, from a volatility perspective, you know, from a, from a, from a obviously annualized expected return perspective. That's the same thing with Bitcoin as well. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is help investors understand when you're going from an environment where it's very likely you're going to make a lot of money in cryptocurrency to an environment where it's very likely that you don't make a lot of money in cryptocurrency. And we're doing the same price, not just cryptocurrency. Obviously, we're doing this for every liquid asset market exposure that ticks. And so going back to, uh, to your questions, like our exposure to those markets, you know, we're, we're very content to maintain those exposures as long as inflation, you know, growth is down, inflation up is the highest probability economic regime over the next three months. Mm. I will argue, I will, just going back to that table real quick um, on slide five, that's, 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 you know, we're kind of coming to an end to that. You know, at some point in the next couple of months, it will no longer be the highest probability regime. You know, take, it, take a look down to the bottom row of this table. Now you're talking about inflation being the, the modal outcome, which is why you see a bunch of red eyes in these columns. Well, deflation starts to become the modal outcome from a conditional probability perspective as you get into January for, mo- for the US and most of the global economies. And so when you get into D, it's very likely crypto is going to start to have some problems as that becomes the highest probability event. And obviously, we're in December. And so maybe that process is already starting to, 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 to play out. Um, I do believe just as a function of the Fed's delayed reaction function, you know, they're well behind the curve in terms of continuing to provide accommodation. So you might not see those Ds realize fully in market pricing terms until we get to a, a much, much a lower level of Fed bond buying. And a much cl- we're much closer in time to the uh, to, to policy rate lift up. And so, in that scenario, you're taking cash off the table, reallocating it elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, the, the the classic pivot you're going to make going from reflation to inflation is increase your exposure to bonds. You know, increase your exposure to defensive assets. You know, maintain or increase your exposure to cryptocurrency. Mm. The pivot going from inflation to deflation is actually take down your exposure to cryptocurrency, take up your exposure to bonds, take up your exposure to cash, U.S. dollar gold, things of that nature. It's much more of a risk-off type portfolio that you want to be, be aware of. And this, again, you can be someone who has a view that inflation should be 50 to 90 basis points higher on average in this decade relative to the previous decade. That's a meaningful shift higher you know, in terms of what that ultimately means from an asset allocation perspective. But it's not a meaningful enough shift higher to suggest that bonds aren't going to go up when growth and inflation decline two to 300 basis points over the course of a calendar year. Right. Right. Okay. Look, Darius, where can people find you if they want to hear more of what you have to say, subscribe, et cetera? Yeah. So we're at 42macro.com. Check us out. I'm pretty, uh, pretty active on Twitter. I love interacting with the community. Uh, the passion to teach, educate. You know, this is uh, over a dozen years of, of, you know, kind of real rugged <laughs> experience on Wall Street in terms of kind of, you know, understanding, getting everything in my brain organized well enough to present the information in this way. And so I'm over at 42, uh, 42 macro D Dale, D D A L E. At Twitter, uh, we have a Twitter account for our firm as well. That's just at 42 Macro. Okay, you got it. Look, Darius, thanks so much for making the time and coming on. I appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. Look forward to next time, Jay. Thank you so much for having me.
Okay, guys, three last things. First, if you enjoy my interviews and would like a bit more, you can subscribe to my Friday newsletter. It's free and the comment to subscribe is right beneath this video in that pinned comment. In this newsletter, I share my key lessons learned, takeaways, and any actions that I might be taking in the market as a consequence of what I've learned on the show. Second, when I started a YouTube channel, I never anticipated generating any advertising revenue. But coincidentally, I do now, which is awesome. And so what I've decided to do is donate this to an organization that is very close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Their mission is to end youth homelessness. The way they do this is by providing young people experiencing homelessness with supportive housing, employment, professional support, life skills, and outdoor adventure. Because often young people in urban centers with no resources will never get the opportunity to experience wild places, nature that can be so transformational and absolutely was for me. Third, if you prefer to listen to my content, you can now find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Jay Martin Show.